Hello, my name is Will Barron. I am the founder of Salesman.org and welcome to today's live chat. I hope you're all doing well. What day is it today? It's Friday. It's Friday. I usually do this on Thursday. It's Friday because it was my dad's birthday yesterday, so I was back off to good old St. Helens. It's Friday the 16th of April. If you've not been on one of these live chats before, I will answer your sales, business, life questions, whatever you want to throw at me. As long as it's somewhat appropriate, I will do my best to answer it. So leave your questions in the live chat uh, boxes below, across, alongside, wherever it is, whether you're watching this on LinkedIn, whether you're watching this on YouTube, or whether you're watching this now on Twitch, where I expect zero people to be watching it. because so I've got zero audience on Twitch, clearly, because this is a B2B sales uh, kind of podcast, live chat, live stream. Okay, so with that said, we'll go for, what time is it? Uh, we'll go for about 30, 40 minutes or so, and then we'll wrap things up. So first question, Keelan asks, how do I know if it's time to take the leap to management? I'm assuming you mean sales management here. Um, the the most common way, if I move over to here, the most common thing I see with salespeople when they want to move into sales management is you've got the salesperson, you've got a customer, and this is a back and forth right between salesperson and customer. And over time, salespeople resent their customers. They hate getting pestered, moaned out. They hate cold calling them, cold emailing them, getting told to do this, do that, get lost. Uh, it's probably the, the lightest way that salespeople are often told to uh, to stop calling or, or, or emailing. Well, a lot of the time, management, salespeople want to move into management so that there's a, there's a wall there between them and the customers and they don't have to deal with what they seem as shenanigans. Now, unfortunately, this wall here is is admin. So if you are sick of customers and you love working from spreadsheets, great. Sales management is probably for you. Now, this thing, this all gets a little bit more complex and gets a little bit more interesting when we're talking about and when we're moving over to sales leadership, because then you are talking more strategy, you're building a team. Um, obviously, as a sales manager, you're going to be hiring and firing as well. But at sales leadership, uh, all this gets a lot more interesting. And of course, to get that leadership position, what's that? That's a four. To get that leadership position, typically you need sales management. Not many salespeople make that leap. Um, as I'm drawing here and you can't see it, not many salespeople make that leap straight into sales leadership. And so, yeah, you, if you want to go into leadership, if you've got aspirations to become CEO, uh, to get an executive, um, to do things later on perhaps in your career, then management is going to be a stepping stone for you. If you like making money and you like speaking with customers and you're happy to put yourself out there, then there's nothing wrong with staying in a sales role. You don't have to make that leap. I think a lot of salespeople feel like, well, I've worked in sales for so long. It's almost, it's not almost, there is very literally a stigma about being, well, I'm a salesperson. And if you're a 30-year-old, 20-year-old, fine, you're driving a fast BMW, you're wearing nice suits, you're blitzing around, selling things, no one's bothered. When you're 40, 50, 60, there is a little bit of a stigma around being a salesperson. And so people will make that shift into management because they're concerned about what other people think of them. They've got shallow or heavy, they've got big egos that are you know, shallow in, in their ability to, to, to knock off criticism from other people. And if you enjoy selling and you're making great money doing it, then stick with it. But if you like admin, if you want to get away from customers, management is for you. Um, there we go. That was not a very satisfactory answer, but it's quite a simple question. Aaron asks, do you have any time management advice for a tech sales account executive um, at one of your favorite companies? We're all big fans and keep up, so keep up the great broadcasts. I appreciate that, Aaron. Um, the best way to describe, and there's a video coming out, I don't think it's come out yet. The best way to describe time management, you don't need to read books. You don't need to watch, you don't even need to watch the video that's coming out if it isn't all out already on this YouTube channel on on time management, right? All you've got to understand is you're going from point A to point B and you want to go in the straightest line possible. Now, customers are going to give you objections and they're going to take you off this way and they're going to give you a load of faffing around. You need to pull them back on track to get them from whether it's the you know, opening of a conversation to closing the sale. You need to go from point A to point B. But this also works with 
productivity with everything that you're doing. You're going to have a sales manager who's going to go, hey, can you just fill out this form? Can you do this paperwork? At the end of the year, report is due and I want you to do some of the work for me. And they're going to try and derail you and you tell them to get stuffed <laughs> in a polite way and you get back on track. Because in that scenario, you've got the you got the beginning of the year and then you've got here when you've got to hit your quota. And anything that isn't driving you towards quota, I'm going to sneeze, <coughs> is uh, hopefully it's not COVID, is going to, uh, you, you need to get back on track. You're going to have family, you're going to have friends, you're going to have, if you're working from home, you're going to have Walter the dog driving you back and forth and you need to go from A to B. We need to really refocus and just go from one place to another. Now, once I understood this, once I started to frame this up for myself, everything else became dead simple. You don't need to, time blocking in your diary is valuable. Understanding and setting goals so you know where you're heading is valuable. But once you've got that, the, the basics, that side of things down, as soon as I get a request, someone asks me for something, uh, my partner's working from home and she asks if I could make a cup of tea, whatever it is, and I just go, is that moving me towards what my goal is here, the point B, yes or no? And if it's no, I just don't do it. I'm quite blunt about things. I don't go on other people's podcasts. I don't help out other people with their own training products. I've really cut back the amount of time that I spend mentoring people who are trying to build a podcast audience and things like that right now because I'm very focused on getting from point A to point B and point B when we reach it, hopefully in a maybe six, seven months from now, and we talk about it on this channel, uh, you will see why my head is down and why I'm being slightly obnoxious to people who are trying to get me to help them out with uh, <laughs> different things. Um, okay, what have we got? Tusha, Tusha asks, my client is my client is saying he's happy with the vendors. What should be the telesales pitch is B2B. Telesales diff difficult, right? If you're trying to communicate this all over a phone call, um, when you're saying telesales, I'm, I'm going to make the assumption here that it's a complex, large deal size sale that's worth going after and worth trying to convert accounts. So I think the video for this actually went out yesterday, so check the channel. How, I think it's called entitled something along the lines of how to steal your competitor accounts. So what you've got to suss out is this is the life of your buyer. Um, so this is time and this is pain, the pain that they're going through. So they start off here and then they realize that they've got a problem and your buyer's like, friggin' hell. And as time goes on, the pain goes up until the point where they reach a salesperson and a salesperson goes, or marketing material, whatever it is, and they go, hey, there's an answer, there's a solution. So they dump it all on the salesperson and say, hey, fix this for me. And hopefully the salesperson solves the problem and they get to a new reduced pain point. So this is the amount of pain that's been reduced right here. And this is the value that essentially the original salesperson has added to the conversation. Now, not everything goes smoothly with large, complex enterprise B2B sales and any sale, right? You think you're getting one thing, the specifications are slightly different, how it's delivered wasn't quite what you were expecting. Things weren't perhaps over communicated as over communicated as well as what they should have been. And so the pain rises a little bit and then the buyer settles and they're in what we call status quo, which is this, we've all been there where we got a little bit of a niggle. There's a tiny stone in your shoe. Uh, there's a tiny stone in your shoe, but it's not worth taking your shoe off, taking your socks off, getting it out. You just carry on plodding along. You go, I'll sort it out when I get home. And that's where most B2B sales end at this level here. Now, if you want to convert an account, what you've got to suss out, and you do this from having conversations with the buyer, um, using open-ended questions, asking them questions like, what would be a good question? Um, what's different? Uh, what did you buy and what did you get? So create, start to create separation between where the buyer is and where they expect it to be. Sometimes you'll find that the buyer, if they go for a little bit of pain of changing over to you again, uh, so doing a second sale, well, they can reduce the pain to where they actually wanted it to be in the first place. So the first sale had this amount of pain reduction. You're now doing it this much. And so this is what you need to suss out. Can you add another layer of value? Can you reduce more pain from the buyer from that first transaction? And if you can, 
the buyer's probably going to listen to you. Now, the hardest part is this stone in the shoe problem. How do you get them past the status quo where they go, I've made all these changes, I've got a budget, I've done this and that. How do I get the how do I how do I get my team on board to make another change? It's gonna be a pain, it's weird. But if you can get them through this stone in the shoe, because there's a big enough gap of value right here between where the last salesperson, where the last organization left them and where you can take them, then there's opportunity to do a deal. And this is your value proposition. This is what you should be communicating with the buyer. Hey, you wanted to be here, you're there. I can take you from there to here. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, and the cool thing is once you've done this once, twice, three times, uh, how many, however many times the account has been uh, changed, eventually there are no more value gaps to be had. And so if you're the last person, organization, salesperson, to make that conversion, you'll end up with an account for months, years, decades, because there's no value here to be sucked out for a future salesperson. So you can really lock in long-term accounts, which for me, when I was in medical device sales, fantastic, because they are just helping me hit quota every year, every quarter moving forward uh, without too much effort because I've done, uh, I've, I've, had, I've sucked all the value out of the deal and no one else can come in and take it from me. All right, what do we have? Uh, Kevin asks, I'm a recent college graduate. Congratulations, Kevin, on graduating, mate. That's great stuff. I'm a recent college graduate with a political science degree and I have no sales experience. Do you have any advice on how I start a career in sales? Um, so you're looking for your first sales job and this typically is the most difficult one to get right. I know medical devices when I was trying to break into that space, which is particularly competitive, Everyone was like, well, looking for this, this, and this must have medical device sales experience. So you go on to the next one. This, this, and this. Yeah, well, I might be a good fit for this. Must have medical device sales experience. And so I basically got on a graduate scheme. So that is probably your best bet, Kevin. Now, the issue of a graduate scheme is there's thousands, tens of thousands of, of salespeople, and you're not very differentiated from them because you've got a degree, they've got a degree, and that's basically the entry point to getting on the scheme, right? So you need to source out a few ways to differentiate yourself. That could be, uh, maybe you volunteer, I don't know if you'd volunteer at a startup. How would you differentiate yourself as a new graduate salesperson? You can't just read books. You can't just do training courses. There's no real, and I sell a training product. There is no training product with an, like an accreditation that me as a hiring sales leader, we're hiring for salespeople over at salesman.org as we speak. There's no one, there's no training that I look at that's got accreditation that you could perhaps do that I'd be like, wow, this this really separates you from, from everybody else. So you can't go down that route. Do you have any family or friends who are small business owners that you could go and sell on behalf of? It could be, even if it's a flower shop or something like that, if you could just say, well, I've got a little bit of, I've got the degree, I've met the requirements of the graduate scheme, I have worked at this flower shop part-time for six months, I've been hustling, I've made this many calls, I've sent this many emails, I've set up this many meetings to do X, Y, Z, and maybe you've made 500, a thousand, five grand in flower sales. What I don't know why flowers at the top of my mind here, but you made five grand in flower sales, which obviously isn't anything to uh, shout home about in the B two B world. But that would show that you're keen, that you're 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 into this. The other thing that I would do if you are doing interviews, and this is what I recommend to everyone, this is what I did in all my interviews as well. Come to the interview with a 30, 60, 90 day plan. Um, if you search for 30, 60, 90 day plan in Google, you'll find a salesman.org article and a YouTube video that I did covering it. That will separate you massively from the competition who come in, uh, all especially as blokes of all this selling barado and, and just trying to bullshit the, the application process in the interview. If you come in with a plan of the first 30 days, I'm going to do this. 90 days, we're going to do this uh, and you know, project it forward if you like, even though you don't really know what you're going to be doing because you're brand new uh, to the sales space, you're going to get kudos. People are going to give you a pat on the back for that. So find a graduate scheme, see if you can get any experience, even if you're just hustling part-time after college, whatever it is for someone else, just so you can say, well, I've made X many calls in the past three weeks. Uh, four weeks, whatever it is, that would look great in the when you get to the interview, or even great on a CV. And then the third one, 30, 60, 90 day plan. Come with it in some 
cheesy binder. It'll look ridiculous. It won't be accurate because you've got no experience, but it shows that you're really willing and that you are going to take a step. You've taken things a step further than most of your competitors because uh, if you're hunting for a sales job, it's probably a zero-sum game. There's only going to be a finite number of sales roles, so you've just got to be 1% better than everyone else who's going for those roles. Uh, Pavan asks, I'm moving from engineering to sales and marketing. Congratulations. Um, you should watch some of Victor Antonio's uh, content. You can find him on YouTube. Just search for Victor Antonio. He is an engineering background. I'm moving from engineering to sales and marketing. I find it very interesting and challenging. Good. I find the closing very uh, uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Any tips? So people struggle with closing for... On, on two fronts, right? Uh, let's get a black pen out. One, two. They struggle in closing because they they leave it right until the end of the sales process. So they just plod along. They ask all these nice, interesting, uh, open-ended questions. They get to know the prospect. They think that they can solve the problem. They put a pitch together. Everything's all lovey-dovey. And at the end of the sales process, they're going, shit. I've got to ask this. I've got to, I've got to ask this hail Mary question here. Of have I wasted all this time? I don't know if they're actually interested. And so a lot of salespeople get stressed with the closing process because they save it all to the end. This is very easily solved by doing what we call micro closes. So throughout the sales process, you want to get agreement that what you're doing is working. I'm going to show you how to do this in a second. Um, so it could be after the first meeting, you get agreements that, hey, if what we've outlined here, if we can do that for you, would it make sense to buy the product when we get further throughout the sales process, uh, when we get to the end of the buying process, however, however you want to frame it up. That little micro close there makes the next one easier. And the next one is, hey, uh, if I can prove this, this and this on a spreadsheet with some numbers, Will you introduce me to the budget holder? Can you do this for me? Can you do that to get a bit of an exchange of value here? That makes that next close easier, next close easier. Until when you get to the end, you pretty much got the deal done. You pretty much know that because they've said yes. And you're not you're not trying to manipulate them to say yes. You're not using uh, what people call the, the yes ladder. I might come back to that in a second to explain it to you. You're not trying to manipulate people here. You are genuinely making sure that you're on the right track. You are qualifying hard at the beginning of the sales process. You're doing consulting in the middle, and then you're not afraid to be assertive and ask for the business at the end of it. Now, that's one side of things. So if you're doing lots of micro-closing throughout the sales process, which you should be, every phone call that you have, every email should be, hey, does it make sense to do X, Y, Z on the next step? Then this makes the, the how you go about doing this part two really, really simple. All you've got to do, and I've said it about five times the you just got to ask the question, right? Does it make does it make sense? That's all you've got to ask. Closing is, hey, have have we won the deal? All you got to do is ask the question, does it make sense to move forward with this? And the buyer is even going to go, yeah, it makes sense. Where's the contracts? Let me sign them. Uh, you can even frame that up even smarter of, hey, does it make sense to get the contract signed this week, uh, today, right now? I'll drive over and shove them right in your face so we can get them done. So if the buyer says, yes, well done. You, you won. You closed the deal. Congratulations. It was as simple as just that one question. Now, what happens if the buyer says no? Are we all at this point sad faced and we go home empty handed? Well, no. We're going to ask a follow up question of, what do we need to do to move this forward? And if you've done all these micro closes and the buyer likes you and you've added value throughout the sales process, when you ask this next, the, the second question of, um, does it make sense? And the buyer says no. And you ask the second question of, what do we need to do to move things forward? The buyer's going to coach you. They're going to give you this feedback loop. They're going to say, hey, I'd love to move this forward, but... Uh, Barry is not in yet. He's going to be in the office next week. Can you call me back then? We'll get the three of us on the call and we can get this closed. They're going to coach you. Again, as long as you've done the rest of the sales process correctly and you've not been an arsehole and you're not doing things like the yes ladder to manipulate people, they're going to coach you. And this might take multiple feedback loops to go back and forth until you get the yes. But closing in B2B sales, where you're not using used car salespeople techniques, when you're just being a real 
business person as opposed to a sleazy salesperson. It's literally that easy. So don't be stressed about closing. Do it lots and lots and lots throughout the sales process. Do not leave it until the very end. Then use this sequence of, hey, does it make sense to do X, Y, Z? Yes, great, you've done it. Does it make sense to do X, Y, Z? No. Okay, what does it make sense? Or how do we move this forward? Ask a follow-up question like that. And closing just becomes a non-issue. You won't, you will never, once you start doing this, you'll never even think, you'll forget that you're closing. You'll just see this linear progression throughout the sales process. So there we go. Hope that was useful. Um, what else do we have? Dra la 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 la. Razesh asks, I, I feel like I'm in the longest dry spell ever. I've been in SDR for a while. I'm not spraying and praying. How do I alleviate the funk? This <laughs> is the funk. Um, so this is something that I'm terrible at doing, but it's advice that's been given to me and I give it to people regularly. You might, you might, if you're in the funk, maybe it's time to take a break, whether that's a long weekend where you don't do anything to do with business and sales whatsoever. Um, maybe it's a week off. I know in COVID times, depending where you are in the world, where you're living, it might be difficult to uh, travel or you know get from one place to another. That's fine. Um, have a, what we call it, I assume this translates into the rest of the world. In the UK, we keep getting, because they're trying to market us and get us to uh, spend money in the economy, right? They're pounding this word. They keep telling us to have a staycation. Go somewhere local, do whatever, spend your money on fish and chips, whatever else is British. Go and see some British castles, stately homes, whatever it is. Staycation. Now, if you're in a funk, I know for myself that if I just take a couple of days off, perhaps I'm just sick of doing all this content, right? You can only create so much sales training content, podcast interviews. I can only do so much of it at a time before I need at least a couple of days off. And, and this is coming from someone who works typically seven days a week. I typically don't have time off. And so that's how I break out my funks. Now, I'm going to caveat that in that I was supposed to have a week off over Easter and it didn't happen. So what I've done now is I've booked it in my diary to in three weeks from now to have another week off. If I fail there, I'm going to have another week off. If I fail there, I'm going to keep doing this until I have a solid week off. Um, but yeah, a lot of the time it's just people need to reset. Uh, Razish, if you're in a dry spell, meaning that you've had success previous and you're not having success right now, it could just be that you need a big reset moment. It could be that the market shifted. Um, yeah, but I'd reset. And how, however our subconsciouses tend to work, I find that you know, you have this, you get in the shower, you're just washing yourself and you go, freaking hell, that was a fantastic, that was a, where did that come from? You have a great idea about whatever it is, uh, business-wise or sales-wise or just a great idea for your life. I find that when you take a little bit of a break, some more of those come through. And so that might be what you need to have a breakthrough and to move things quicker and forward. Um, right. Balan asks, hello, Will. Hello, Balan. I have just started a new position. Congratulations on a new role, mate. That's awesome. What can I do to build prospects uh, rather than direct or would you recommend me have my own website to generate leads? So you can leave another comment, uh, Balan. It would be useful to know uh, your product that you're selling, who you're selling it to, and what size company that you're working for. So long term, and we talk about it all the time, salespeople will end up becoming subject matter experts and buyers will only buy from subject matter ex experts. Um, I'll try and very quickly explain why. But if this is, we always talk about the selling cycle. This is the buying cycle, right? <laughs> I don't know if any of you guys could actually read my writing. Sometimes I'm that bad of a speller or write so quick that I think I inadvertently um, make it illegible, illegible, so that people can't see it. So we talk about all the time the sales cycle, what we want to do. We want to prospect, we want to add value, we want to close a sale, we want to buy a boat, buy whatever it is, fast cars, and waste our money on crap. But the buyers don't care about that. The buyers care about the buying cycle. So this is, I'm going to massively oversimplify this just for, for time here. The buyer feels pain, 
They see that they've got an issue. They dump the issue on a salesperson. Oh, no, in fact, let's, let's go one step back. Let's talk about the, the more modern buyer cycle. Let's overemphasize this. Let's, let's overexaggerate it. The buyer feels like they've got a problem, they've got pain, and then they will go on the internet and they will Google stuff. They will find your website, your competitor's website, whoever it is. They will find different solutions and then they will faff around and ponder on it and then the pain will drop. So they've still got some pain, uh, but they've procrastinated. Now they've looked at budget and then around about here, they reach out to a salesperson and you get involved. And hopefully you can reduce their pain, solve their issue and clean up and take some commission from them. This line here used to be like here. It used to be, I've got a problem. I'll call Dell. I've got a problem with my server. I'll call Dell, see what the issue is. Now, I don't want to call Dell. I want to watch a video on YouTube. I want to do this. I want to speak to someone on Twitter. I want to look at some uh, PDFs, documents. So I'm only going to call a salesperson when I basically know what I need. And I need just that little bit of guiding and expertise at the end of the process. Now, all of this is relevant, Balan, because... If you're in a marketplace where you can be this per, you can be this part of the sales cycle by having a website, like with me over at salesman.org, we produce more free sales training content than than anyone, I think. By the time you include the podcasts, all the whiteboard videos that we do, all of the, the blog posts that we do, we have like thousands of people come on the website every day. We've got tens and tens of thousands of people listen to the audio podcasts every day. Um, I think on YouTube, I think we get between like 150 and 100,000 views a month. So thousands of people watching the videos on YouTube as well. Because I want to own this. So when people are looking for sales training, or when people are unsure of how to do something. This is my website. This is my content. This is my subject matter expertise that I don't think that's the expertise. So this is people are coming to me uh, dynamically. People are coming to me organically so that when they go to this point, they go, right, I need to speak to a salesperson. I need to solve this issue for real now. Who are they going to call? Of course, they're going to call me if they've consumed all of this content. And this is how we are managing to really compete with some of these bigger, more established sales training companies, especially on the enterprise side of things. We've got tons of enterprise clients signing up now where they would never have touched us 10 years ago. But now that they can consume all our content and some of our competitors in the sales training space keep everything all, all like lock and keyed and and it's all like smoke and mirrors and they don't want to share anything. They've got these secret proprietary uh, training techniques and methodologies. Well, the buyer goes, I don't know what I'm going to get there. I'm pretty confident what I'm going to get over here. I've done all this research with this one individual. We're going to go with him or we're going to go with that company. So this is a long winded answer to your question. But until, or I guess there's two things. If you've got inbound leads coming your way, you don't need to do any of this because your marketing team is going to do it probably way more efficient than what you are doing. But if you want to be in the job that you're in long term, you said you started a new position. If, you, if you're selling car, car is a terrible example. If you're selling studio equipment and you love studio equipment, you live and dream and, and eat studio equipment, then you should start building your personal brand in that space. You should start becoming who people go to before they make the call because when they make that call, it's going to be you. Now, if you don't really like your career, your job, and you're just doing it for money, then all this kind of, this, this method falls apart, but this is the future of sales. There's going to be far fewer sales. I'm, I'm happy to be called out on this in five, 10 years from now. There's going to be far fewer salespeople. The salespeople that are still around are going to be subject matter experts. They're going to create content. They're going to own a brand in the space, and they're going to make millions of dollars doing it. Literally millions. You're not going to have an OTE of 50, 60 grand or whatever it is for a beginner sales role. You're literally going to be doing hundreds and hundreds of thousands, if not millions in commissions. So, freaking hell. There we go. <laughs> that was that one. Um, David asks, who is the Will Baron of sports sponsorship sales? Uh, I've no idea, but I've actually... I've genuinely no idea. I've I've had a, a bunch of people listen to the show and reach out though, or listeners of the show reach out who sell sports sponsorships for like the F1, obviously, which I'm a massive fan of, of NASCAR, which I'm less interested in, but it's still really cool. 
and um, we had a, a guy who was selling sponsorships. Literally, so this is awesome. He worked for Chelsea Football Club and he was in the midst of trying to, I can't remember the company he was dealing with, but trying to get the one big brand on the front of the jerseys that they all wear. He was working on the deal for that. For that. I think it was like 2023 he was working on um, because they wanted to change. Um, I'm hoping none of this is too confidential that he shared with me. But they wanted to change uh, sponsorships from whoever they were at some point in the past when I spoke to him. There we go. Covered that one. Uh, just saved his ass nicely there because they weren't happy with the current sponsor with the sponsors that they had at some point in the past. So yeah, um, it's fascinating. It's re I find it fascinating in the value that a sports team has when it's eyeballs and attention, which is incredibly difficult to measure. And it's similar to what I do, right? So we've, we've partnered with HubSpot. There's HubSpot branding all over everything that we do. And you can somewhat measure the number of clicks that we get from our content that then people who consume some, they'll click from our content, they'll go on HubSpot's website. They will then uh, hopefully buy a product at some point at some point in the HubSpot sales cycle. But it's very difficult to tie, hey, I watch World's podcast and I spent 50 grand a month or 100 grand a year on a premium HubSpot account. It's very difficult to track that. Tools and software is coming that'll make that more easy over the next kind of three, four years, two, three years. But it's very difficult to do that right now. So if you take the little the, the little nonsense amount of content and attention that I have and you compare it with the Formula One, you compare it with the new Aston Martin team that has very few sponsors on because they're clearly... Um, it's a new team for this year and they're trying to build up their sponsorship portfolio. Being a salesperson for Aston Martin, Formula One, and I don't know, I don't think it's actually Aston Martin. It's, uh, you know, it's the team and Aston Martin's like the main sponsor. However it works, whatever, whoever is running that team underneath it, that must be the fascinating job because how do you communicate? Well, people are going to see logos on these cars whizzing around a racetrack and that may or may not translate to them buying your premium products. And, and the brand association with Aston Martin might get people to buy these products. Communicating that value is insane. That is way more interesting to me than some SaaS product, which improves your ability to hire, fire, and, and manage your HR staff. Uh, the, the sports sponsorship side of things is fascinating to me. It was probably something that I'd look at. To, if, I, if I had to get into another sales job in the not too distant future, it's something that I would definitely consider. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to spend time with cool athletes, cool people, and that side of things as well. So I don't have an answer to your question, David. But yeah, sports sponsorships are awesome, especially when you're in the big leagues. Okay. What do we have? I'm going to have a quick sip of my drink. Time real. I'll do a couple more of these and then we'll get things wrapped up. Paul asks, my boss says we shouldn't use Calendly links. I know you use them too. I do. We use them for all kinds of stuff. Uh, to book meetings as it makes us look lazy. I understand where he's coming from. And I agree that we should make an effort, that we should make the effort to get the prospect booked into a demo. But isn't this just industry standard practice now? Yes, Paul, your boss is an idiot. <laughs> to put it bluntly. Um, so we use calendar links and people actually, it is the industry standard now. Everyone's used to them. Um, but when we first started using them, people would write to us and say, hey, this is so much easier than going back and forth, trying to book things in. So yeah, do, I don't think people, I don't think your buyers are going to care that you've sent them a calendar link. Maybe if you want to compromise, you could say, hey, in your emails to potential customers, hey, do you have a booking link? Or was, or was it easier if you book a slot in my diary with my link? Here it is. That's probably the uh, compromise that you're looking for there. Um, Virtual Hero asks, how has the pandemic and now the opening of the UK industry, of, of industry in the UK, I'll rephrase that, affected your own sales numbers? So I've been banging, we've done, we've, we've done really well. And some of it's right place, right time. Some of it was the fact that for five years, I've been banging on that sales leaders, sales managers and sales people don't need people to come in and do one day training, spend 20 grand a pop on it 
because it, and there's tons of data that it's just not retained. It's pointless. Now, if you're doing a sales kickoff and you want a motivational speaker to come in to get everyone really riled up at the beginning of the quarter or each year, whatever it is, fine, that is different. But to have sales trainers come in, do one day events, one day training sessions or three day training sessions, whatever it is, and not support your sales team with, with, with content, with training over the long term is stupid. It doesn't work. It literally doesn't work. And I've been on the receiving end of tons of crappy sales training as well. Now, I've been banging this drum for like five years, since I, six years now, since I started the original Salesman podcast. And, uh, you know, it took a COVID pandemic for other companies to pivot. And now everyone has blended learning solutions, online training. The whole industry has shifted to what we've been doing for since, since the beginning, right? We've always had online video uh, training and, and different tools on top of the training to add a level of engagement and retention. Um, and of course, now that people can't go in and do these sales training sessions, now everyone's pivoting to what we've been banging a drum on. So in answer to your question, we've had a great couple of years. Um, building up to this pre-COVID and then COVID it just went absolutely apeshit for us. We did really well. And uh, again, maybe I could have been wrong. I'm pretty sure I wasn't wrong because the data was on my side with doing online long-term training as opposed to one-off events. And the market, the sales training market, I think it's like, a, this is insane, right? It's a multi-billion dollar a year industry. Billion. It's like three or four billion dollars a year that's spent on sales training. Um, and obviously, we've only got a tiny like, sliver of it. And a lot of it's done internally in that as well in larger enterprise organizations that we'll, you know, some of them we'll, we'll never be able to touch. But yeah, we were just right place at the right time. But I do feel like I had a bit of an insight on this that we didn't do in person training because it doesn't work, it's not as effective. All the training providers did in person training because you can charge a lot more for a single day, multi-day events, then you can. It's easier to justify, hey, George George McGeorgeson is going to come in and train us all. It's all going to be lovely. We'll have sandwiches. We'll have some cakes at lunch, whatever it is. Usually some crappy hotel uh, curry Indian food that will be laid out as well. And it'll be a good get together. And we can have a team meeting after the fact. And we can tie it in with a kickoff meeting. That stuff just doesn't work. But you can charge a shitload of money for doing it. And so... I put the money to one side then to focus on what building what I knew was more valuable and more useful, uh, what, what would become more valuable and useful, and COVID just accelerated it. So yeah, there we go. Uh, right, a couple more. Ban asks, can introverts be good at sales? Yes, introverts can be great at sales. I would check out if you are an introvert and you've got a hang up on this. Head over to Matthew Pollard. If you search for him over at salesman.org in the big search box that's on there, if you uh, just Google him, he's got a number of books on selling as an introvert, as networking as an introvert. Um, I am not an introvert myself, so I can't comment personally on selling as an introvert, but there's no reason why you can't have success. An introvert versus an extrovert. It isn't shy versus outgoing. It's just how you um, recharge your batteries. So if you're an extrovert, and most people are somewhat in the middle, there's a gray area in between. If you are an out and out extrovert, you charge your batteries by being around people, by having conversations, by getting going to events and, and going playing uh, team sports and, and having all that banter. If you're fully on the other end as an introvert, you recharge by doing whatever you're doing and then going and sitting, reading a book, watching a TV show, chilling out in a little bit more silence. But all it is is recharging your battery. Then you can use that battery to go at things, batter it, call, call, email, whatever it is. Um, it's just how you recharge as an introvert or an extrovert, which is the main differentiation between the two. So if you're an introvert, it doesn't mean that you are naturally shy. It doesn't mean that um, you don't confuse being shy with being an introvert. There's plenty of shy extroverts as well. Um, so yeah, you can definitely have success as an introvert. And uh, Matthew Pollard is the man for that kind of content. Okay, we'll do one more and then we will wrap things up. Um, Reggie Meester, this is, do you know what? This is actually hilarious. Reggie, congratulations, sir. Um, you are the first question that we've ever had from Twitch. You're probably the, I can't see the stats. You're probably the only person watching on Twitch as well because I'm not, I'm not promoted that we're going to be live streaming on Twitch whatsoever. Um, just the software we're using allows us to do it without any issues. So I thought, let's throw it up there as well. 
So I appreciate the question. Reggie says, haha, awesome. <laughs> Reggie, legend. Okay, what's your question, mate? Any advice for somebody who wants to get into selling with no prior experience? And um, so we covered this earlier on in the live stream, right? You suss out what you want. So I'll break it down for you as our one and only single Twitch uh, live streaming fan, right? So sell what you want first. So for me, I always wanted, when I got into medical device sales, I wanted a technical role. I didn't want to be cold calling people. I didn't want to be dealing with idiots. So now you've narrowed down your focus. So you've sussed out that you want to do X, Y, Z with one, two, three people. Now you can start sus Now you can start solving this problem of having no experience. Maybe there's someone who knows someone who can make an introduction so you can spend a day in the field. So I had regularly as a medical device salesperson, I was only a... Uh, I'd gone beyond a junior rep, but I certainly wasn't classed as like a senior rep within the organization. I regularly had people out with me who wanted to see if medical device sales would be for them. And they just came out, they didn't say anything all day. They just followed me around and um, they didn't really engage with the customers or anything like that, but they shadowed me. So maybe you know someone who knows someone who can do uh, introduce you to someone who can get you a day out shadowing in the field. Because when you then start to apply for jobs and you say, hey, I want to be in medical device sales, you've got your CV or your resume, and I've, I've shadowed. And then you start to talk about, well, I've built a 30, 60, 90 day plan. So this is something that we've covered on the podcast tons of times, the Salesman Podcast. And um, I feel like I've got to justify the uh, where everything is and all the links for you, Reggie, if you are our one and only um, Twitch fan here. So yeah, salesman.org, um, Salesman Podcast on iTunes, Google Play, everywhere else. The world's most downloaded B2B sales podcast. Um, head up or look up 30, 60, 90 day plan. Now, you've no idea what should really go into this plan and some of our content will guide you through it and none of it is going to be accurate at all because you don't have the experience in the space yet. But just putting together that 30, 60, 90 day plan that's going to massively set you apart from all of the other candidates um, that you're going to be going up against because you've got to remember, and this is, the, this is a learning point if you're new to sales, right? Um, or if you're trying to break into sales, both getting your sales job and also most B2B deals, um, business to business deals, they're what we call a zero sum game. Let me jot this out. Uh, it's very simple. So let's say zero sum game, right? There is, there is, there is one hole, there is multiple people, right? Trying to fill it. Only one of them is going to win. Typically, sales managers, hiring managers, they're only hiring four people because there's only a budget for them. There's only plans for them. They're only hiring one person. Two people have just left, so they're only hiring two people. This is good news. This means that all of these competitors that you've got here for the sales role that you're trying to um, you're, you're trying to break into, you only need to be 1% better than them to win. If they're all idiots, you just have to be slightly less of an idiot to get the job. And this translates over to B2B sales as well. The buyer has a problem. They're only going to probably solve it once for the foreseeable future. You only need to be 1% better than your competitors. Now, if you're in a marketplace where your competitors are awesome, then it's a problem. But that's usually not the case. Most of the time, most salespeople suck. So it's not that difficult. Again, you don't need to be incredible at any of this. You only need to be that 1% better and you're going to have uh, massive upside and you're going to get jobs you want. You're going to close deals that you want. Don't feel like you've got to be a superstar of any of this stuff. It helps, clearly. The deal is going to come in easier if you are 120% better than the competitors. But you only need to win. Uh, to win, you only need to be that 1% better. So that's the way I like to frame it up. It's when I'm doing contracts, when we're when I'm selling things over at salesman.org, when we're selling to the enterprise, which is a big focus of mine at the moment. It's the same thing, 1% better and you're going to get the deal done. Right, Reggie, thanks man, that was really useful. I appreciate you, Reggie, our one and only Twitch uh, follower. I'm going to wrap things up there because I am freaking shattered. It's Friday night, I'm going to have a beer, I'm going to have a chill out with the dog and my girlfriend. And with that, I'll speak with you again on next week on, I'll speak with you again, I always fail this. I always fail the intros and the outros of all of our content. You guys don't see this. I recorded with Victor Antonio yesterday, uh, this week in sales. So we record on a Thursday afternoon and it gets edited on Friday and it goes out on a Saturday morning. It must have took me like five attempts to say, welcome to this week in sales and go through the, the title topics. 
It's it's ridiculous. This is how unprofessional I am. I'd be terrible on a on a TV show. But with that, this was or well, that was this that doing it again. That was selling makes simple live the live chat. I might just call it the live chat moving forward. And I'll speak you. I'll speak with you again on next week's show. Cheers, guys.